Hi, my name is Doug Sparks, and I'm happy to be talking to you about the evolution of MEMS packaging. Now, I've worked in MEMS packaging in a variety of applications, industrial, automotive, uh, medical, consumer. Uh, and what I found is that, you know, packaging varies widely. I mean, there's more than 50 shades of MEMS packaging. Uh, industrial devices are huge, expensive. Go down to consumer devices, they're small, thin, low power. And in between, you have aerospace, automotive, you even have medical implants that have to be biocompatible. So you can imagine the variety of MEMS package designs that have been come up with and implemented over the past several decades. Look at the issues. I mean, there's a huge variety of issues. And again, some of it's dependent on applications. Uh, some of it's pretty standard, you know, die attach, wire bonds. Uh, are you going to bump? Are you going to have through silicon vias? Uh, are you going to vacuum seal it? Uh, is it has to be hermetic? Uh, how are you going to test and calibrate it? So there's all kinds of issues, and that's what we're going to briefly go over today in this review. Now, if you look at a consumer MEMS device, there's typically three main parts to the product. You know, you do have your package, but you have your MEMS chip, obviously. Sometimes you have an ASIC, sometimes it has an underlying circuit board. And then you have to think about testing calibration, and calibration is critical for sensors because you've got different stimulus, whether it's motion, acoustic, infrared, or, or gases. Okay, when you first start a MEMS sensor design, what basic elements do you look at? I like to start with the operating temperature range uh, using um, finite element modeling, using the TCEs or Young Modulus. Look at what materials you can stack up, uh, how you're going to put the assembly together. And then will the sensor be uh, exposed to chemicals or fluids? If they are, what's the pressure, uh, maximum pressure it's gonna see? What's the flow rate range if it's a flow sensor? Is there a corrosion aspect that you have to consider uh, in dealing with the materials and how the MEM sensor is gonna interface with those materials? There are mechanical issues. Uh, is it gonna be subject to high levels of vibration or mechanical shock? This may be most evident in an automotive or aerospace uh, type of application. Then look at the electrical requirements. What's the EMC environment that the part's gonna be used in? Is it gonna be used next to an electric motor or perhaps an internal combustion engine where there's gonna be a lot of EMC uh, bombardment? Look at ESD, particularly during assembly. And then look at the power electrical interface. What's the connector gotta be made up of? Uh, or maybe it'll be wireless, who knows? Finally, package size. If you're particularly in consumer or wearable space, you're gonna to have to really shrink down your package elements, your package size, and look at how it's gonna integrate into the overall system. <clears throat> we often um, start with a new concept with uh, finite element modeling. Uh, and that's where you consider the, the materials you're gonna use, the package type, you put it all together and you see how the thermal coefficient of expansion and young modulus affects stresses in the design over your operating temperature range. You can also use modeling uh, for fluid interactions. There may be turbulence issues if it's a flow sensor. There may be pressure, overpressure things to consider if it's a pressure sensor. You can also model uh, EMC. You can model, model resonant frequency uh, for an overall package and also for the resonating elements in a, a particular type of MEMS device. So always think if you have good MEMS uh, models and a good MEMS modeling system, try to take a look at it uh, through FEM. If you're dealing with corrosive fluid exposure, whether it's a gas or a liquid or, or a biological system, you've got to think of protecting the element. On the front side of any IC, ASIC, or MEMS device, you gotta think about the runners. A lot of uh, runners typically have aluminum, and that's very easily corrodible in a saltwater environment. Um, so perylene, silicone gel coatings are all thought of. Uh, for pressure sensors, a lot of work went into backside sensing several years ago. 
and a variety of companies develop different backside sensitive uh, approaches um, to avoid exposing the circuit level. However, this has die attach issues to think about, and it has the stack up of the uh, materials with regard to operating temperature range and uh, uh, thermomechanical issues. And then there's what level of packaging are you going to use? Um, it's not just a, a ceramic or metal package, but it can be started at the wafer level package. So you have a, a chip scale package approach, which is very common. Uh, you may need a hermetic approach. Probably you're going to use wafer bonding, but CVD sealing has been used in some devices. Uh, are you going to wire bond? Are you going to try to develop it through silicon via? You have your sub package. That's the more conventional package that we think of as a plastic or ceramic package. Then you have your system housing, particularly in automotive and industrial applications that the sub package has to integrate into. And then finally, you have shipping containers. That's a type of packaging that we all have to think about to avoid, you know, drop shock events uh, just in transporting the final product. Uh, it's interesting when you look at uh, a typical MEMS product development cycle, it tends to go through a packaging process that mimics the evolution of MEMS packaging itself. You know, we always start in the lab, maybe in a vacuum chamber, uh, but you might then graduate to a TO can or a ceramic package if you want, if you have a vacuum package device. Uh, eventually, this will translate into a plastic package for automotive and consumer applications. And then ideally, particularly in the future, we want to get to chip scale packaging, where it's just a chip, maybe just bumped chips, no wire bonding, no sub package. And that could combine the MEMS and ASIC together. Now, the first MEMS package was developed uh, for germanium discrete transistors back in the 1950s. That's what we call the TO can. It's uh, a Kovar, low TCE Kovar metal. It has reflow glass electrical feed throughs that you wire bond to. Very straightforward. You probably, if you, if you think of old transistors, you think of these types of packages. You can do vacuum packaging. Uh, you can make the lid an infrared or x-ray transparent uh, cover. Uh, it can be a filter. Those can be coated for chemical sensors. It can be a perforated gas filter, or you can have tubes on the lid and or the header, the bottom portion for pressure and differential pressure sensor applications. Um, a derivative of this is the industrial pressure sensor. So they took, a, they took this concept of the TO can and made a very robust header, stainless steel with the same glass feed throughs that you wire bond the chip to. Uh, then they uh, die attach the MEMS chip, do the wire bonding, they weld or compression fit a corrugated corrosion resistant metal diaphragm, which is then silicon oil backfilled. Uh, and you transmit the pressure through this corrugated metal diaphragm. And this is a corrosion resistant material. It can be hastaloid, stainless steel, titanium to protect the pressure sensor, protect the MEMS element. Uh, a group in uh, Japan, uh, NKS, came up with a novel idea in the 90s where they basically made their own sensor clean room and they put CVD, dope polysilicon, wheatstone bridges on uh, stainless steel, polished stainless steel elements, really tiny, you know, anywhere from a half to four millimeter diameter round uh, pressure sensor uh, strain gauges. They're kind of thimble shaped. They had nitride and sputtered metal films. You know, it was essentially a full wheatstone bridge fab on steel. I had the uh, I had the the good um, luck to work with them for three years in a technology transfer development process uh, to learn all about this. It was really interesting. Another kind of parallel, a little bit later, um, similar effort that went into pressure sensors was thinning single crystal silicon uh, piezo resistive strain gauges down and attaching them to a, a sandblasted a steel diaphragm using reflow glass. So MSI, uh, Sensata, and others have taken that approach to backside sensing where the backside isn't silicon, it's stainless steel. Then we get to uh, the ceramic packages. Again, this is an idea developed for ICs in the 1960s. 
Uh, it's been widely used for um, high reliability applications like aerospace and military. It's still used today. The, the gold-plated Kovar lid is put upside down on this graphite plate in the center. Then you have a uh, typically a gold tin solder preform in the ceramic package with a weight uh, placed there. The, the MEMS chip is in the ceramic package. You heat that up in vacuum, reflow the solder, and you've got yourself a nice little vacuum sealed ceramic package, which is extremely reliable. Again, still being used particularly for resonators, gyros, RF switches. Um, in the late 70s, early 80s, the automotive industry started using MEMS devices and packaging them in uh, lead frame based plastic packages. This was to take the cost out of Kovar or ceramic packages and it allowed customization for integrating the package into the engine module typically. Uh, we started with the uh, MAP pressure sensors that went to a variety of other pack pressure sensors, fuel vapor, turbo. The same pressure sensor approach was used for occupant seat detection. Uh, and then in a derivative of that again, used for airbag sensors. And these were really early chiplets. We were putting uh, silicon chips, uh, MEMS chips on circuit boards, wire bonding them to the circuit board. So uh, we did calibration at kind of like the system level. But again, some were flip chips, some were wire bonded. Again, trailblazing the chiplet approach back in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, medical applications. Once the pressure sensor process with plastic inexpensive packages was developed, it began to almost immediately be used for blood pressure cuffs. Uh, Motorola was the leader in this, uh, now NXP, uh, making millions of these devices uh, in, in, across the world. It's also made in Japan, Europe, etc. We uh, have now gone to the point where we're implanting MEMS sensors, pressure sensors, and other types of temperature sensors uh, into, into the human body. And of course, along with that comes a lot of issues. Uh, blood is a very corrosive material. It's salt water and white blood cells, with tissue growth issues. It's gotta be biocompatible. So typically you're looking at Pyrex or titanium sensor uh, materials for implants. It's a narrow temperature range, but it's got to require the FDA approval. And class three FDA approval takes millions of dollars and many years uh, to get that approval. And then consumer. Consumer is where MEMS took off from the tens of millions per year to billions per year. Uh, microphones alone are over 2 billion microphones are made uh, per year for, for just smartphones. Uh, FBAR, billions per year. You have inertial sensors, uh, etc. So there's lots of consumer MEMS devices. The key things there are very small, very thin, very low cost, and easily integratable into a surface mount type process. Now let's look at the cost breakdown for a typical consumer device. You know, there's kind of the old, the old axiom that it's a third MEMS, a third ASIC, and a third package and test. Uh, that, that's roughly close. It can be plus or minus 10, 20%. Here's an example from System Plus Consulting for an inertial product I worked on. Uh, where the ASIC was 46%, the MEMS was 28%, uh, and then the rest was packaging and test. So uh, just to kind of look, that's, that's what it takes, that's what it costs uh, when you divide up all the items in a MEMS product. Now, where are these consumer devices being made? Uh, back in the 70s, late 60s, IC assembly, or transistor, so actually discrete transistor assembly and IC assembly, started moving to Asia, out of Silicon Valley, uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, now Malaysia, China, Philippines. Uh, this is where the center of MEMS OSAT activity is occurring for consumer and a lot of the automotive space. So think Asia when you think of the supply chain for your uh, MEMS products. Now, what's the, what's the next progression? We're going to use the wafer level packaging developed for automotive and consumer applications to get to chip scale packaging. That's what we're looking at. Um, a typical uh, wafer to wafer bonding requires alignment between the wafers. Could be a MEMS device on one wafer, could be an ASIC on another. Uh, and it could be wire bonded, could have through silicon vias and bump attachment. So those are some of the things 
you have to consider when you're going towards chip scale packaging in the future. And if you're using wafer bonding, you got to think of temperatures. Uh, silic, conventional silicon to silicon fusion stacks take a long high temperature anneal, so that's up to 1,000 degrees. A lot of active elements, whether they're chemical sensors or infrared coatings or filters, can't handle those temperatures. They're going to be restricted to adhesive, plasma activated, or solder type bonding down in the you know, 200 to 300 degrees C range. The bulk of most inertial sensors that you're seeing in the market now uh, are probably using uh, eutectic or maybe even glass fritz still. And that's in the 300 to 450 type degree C range. So always consider when you're trying to go to wafer level packaging, chip scale packaging, you got to think of what are the processing temperatures that the elements being bonded and sealed together will see. Now, if you're wanting to make a resonator, whether it's an F bar or gyro, you got to think of cavity pressure. And whenever you seal a device in a wafer bonder, no matter how well you bake it, there's always some molecule desorptions of water vapor, or oxygen, nitrogen. One approach to getting rid of that is thin film getters. And this kind of shows some work I did early on where without a thin film getter in the vacuum sealed cavity, the Q values of this resonator was around 36 to 40. With a thin film getter that we developed, you know, the Qs could be over 60,000. So huge improvement just by adding a single mask and thin film getter uh, step. And this type of metal, uh, metal getter has also been applied to Kovar and stainless steel packages, which opens up the ability to integrate, say, a germanium lid for an infrared device or sapphire glass for optical, uh, maybe even steel or Kovar lids. Uh, depending on your EMC and reliability requirements. And the reason that's important is hermeticity, helium hermeticity uh, specifically. Uh, a few years ago, you probably saw some headlines about iPhones basically dying when they were around MRI machines, which have a, uh, use a lot of helium. So uh, the particular MEMS devices in those phones were not helium hermetic. They were uh, actually first generation CVD seal devices. Um, I did a lot of studying of wafer to wafer bonding and other packaging, and I found that the majority of wafer to wafer bonded uh, MEM seals were not helium hermetic. This is an example of how Q degraded versus time in, uh, in helium. And really just a 10, 15 minute exposure to helium uh, pressure could cause Q to degrade. Now, I found that ceramic and TO welded lids packages were helium hermetic. And I was eventually able to get a wafer to wafer bond process to work that would be uh, hermetic. Now, we gotta think about the future of MEMS packaging and the future applications. And one really interesting thing is quantum technology. And it's really cool to see that wafer level packaging of MEMS devices is being applied to quantum devices. These quantum vapor cells that are used in this technology are using wafer to wafer bonding. They're using glass wafers. They're using thin film getters. Uh, they're using uh, unique vapor ambience to make these vapor cells. So they're going to be looking in the future to shrink these huge quantum devices down to chip scale package MEMS chips. So just keep that in mind. It's really an interesting development. So in conclusion, MEMS sensor packaging is quite diverse. It depends on the application. Uh, it's been evolving for four, over 40 years through discrete metal and ceramic packages, all the way down to wafer level packaging and chip scale packaging. New packaging methods are constantly being developed to shrink the MEMS product and reduce costs. And when you think in terms of package design, you got to think of the science, material science, material compatibility over the, over the range of operating uh, parameters, whether it's pressure or temperature. You got to think of the form factor. How do you shrink it if it's consumer? And then how do you calibrate the sensor? How do you expose it to the infrared radiation, uh, the gaseous pressure or motion, vibration, uh, et cetera? And how do all these things fit together? And that's where the package has to integrate all these different parameters needed to produce a great MEMS sensor product. Thank you.